What's up, people? How's everybody doing? Hope we're all enjoying this wonderful event. I'm super excited to share what I have and break down some of my uh, long lessons in life and how to the things I've gotten to where I am in my career. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. I see it's live here. Hello there. Let me, uh, to Rashad, what's going on, boss? You went to RISD. Actually, I did an art exhibit at RISD back in the day. Just give it like another minute or two. What's up, Neng? What's up, everybody? How are we all doing? This room is real, by the way. Everything behind me, that's all real stuff. That is not a, uh, uh, what you call it, like a wallpaper. Uh, for the Philippines, what's going on? I've got family out there, too. <clears throat> Singapore, I have some colleagues out in Singapore as well that work for BNY Mellon. What's going on, Rupali? All right, so we're going to get the party started. <clears throat> so this uh, presentation that I'm going to discuss is a trend that I've seen in the design world for about as long as I've been in the design world. And that is how designers are like uh, marginalized by their understanding of tech. And I found it kind of simple to not get yourself marginalized by that. And I found it in multiple ways, not only from people in the industry, but people that are not necessarily in our industry. And I've always used a variety of different ways of making, like finding inspiration and the like. So to start off, what I've seen with like the high salaries, the high demand uh, for like t talented designers that are out there, it makes it really hard for anyone to resist not joining our industry. I absolutely love that fact. And more importantly, you don't need a fancy degree. Right. Like you could just kind of learn this stuff through YouTube from friends or maybe even a couple of events and then go out there and try your hat and try to make it work. And it, it brings me to a quote that a close friend of mine, Lee Delgado, shared with me many years ago. And I always refer to this. And it says the future belongs to those who learn more skills and combine them in creative ways. And that was written by Robert Greene. But knowing that the thing that I see what I teach is that a lot of the kids coming out of school uh, don't have the technical knowledge of how things are built. So they're really good at making it look good, but then it kind of falls apart when it gets handed off to dev or it's trying to get put it to some sort of design system and the like. So with that, let me break down a little bit about myself. So like I said, my name is Joey Kilrain. Uh, I've been a designer for close to 20 years now. Uh, I started off many moons ago when the internet was just first starting. And I remember being deathly afraid of the internet because all I could think of is, oh my God, that is going to take over. Like, I'm not going to have like any shot at life and what that's going to be. So with that, I dedicated all my time and effort into learning uh, code. And I did it without a book. And I just kind of copy and paste this stuff and just really struggled to figure it out. But in the end, it actually paid off. And how it paid off was just being uh, persistent and continuously trying to learn. So the big thing that I know in our world, and it's rarely addressed by designers, is the fact that we're usually undervalued, right? Uh, if a dev guy comes in or some of the dev team, they may just come in and say, you know what? We're going to do it this way and you have to follow either this template or you have to follow uh i don't know like this design system like download ant design and go use that or we're just going to take google material ui and just use that and don't change anything and i find that's like really silly right uh and it can be avoided but the problem is a lot of the designers don't get into the code side so like i said earlier a lot of times they make it look really good but then they lack on the technical skill putting it together and it's actually not that complicated to go and do that stuff. And more importantly, when I see a lot of designers either like focus all their energy on Figma or focus on their energy on Sketch, I think, yeah, that's not a good idea either because look what just happened with Figma getting gobbled up by Adobe, 
right? Inevitably, it, it'll probably go through some change. But yeah, you never know. And you may have to get into another tool. So we should never really focus all of our agilities on just like, like software and that kind of thing. We should really focus on what's the process and the protocols to building things. And actually, there's a second problem with it. So the big problem is obviously just the technical knowledge. But what I find with the second problem is the lack of confidence. Because a lot of times people get a little nervous about how like they don't know how to build and they don't want to make a mistake. And quite honestly, that's the only way you learn is by going through and making some mistakes. So this leads to why I think titles create silos. Uh, a lot of times, if you hear like a UX designer, they may not spend any time with the developers. Not all of them, right? Definitely not all of them. But in, in some cases, they don't spend time with the developers. Why? Because that's their house. I'm not going to get into that. Or we have like product designers that may not go talk to the visual designers. Why? Because that's not my side of the house. And I've always found it really silly uh, when people do that because I think, why are you going to put yourself in a box, right? You should definitely get out there and work with these guys. So not only can you sympathize with what they do, but also empathize with how they need their stuff. So to give you an example, the more time I spent with dev, the more I started to understand how they'd like to give them code or give them our work as a designer, like what's the handoff process? Because when you think about, or at least my experience with developers, when I think about how they operate, they just want to take the work and start coding right away. That's all they want to do. They don't want to hear uh, what call they got to pick or they got to make adjustments. Nope, they just want to take the work and run with it. Designers are on the flip side of that. Designers do like to get input, at least most of us want to get some input. And they also want to be, have the ability to like sit and kind of just muddle over their work and figure this is what I want to do. So it's a little different when they have the developers work, but if we think what the developers need, that'll make their lives easier. And a lot of that is just reducing that title to say, hey, even though I'm a designer, I should come and hang out with you guys as developers. Now, who or what made me aware of production being so important? And some of my idols, uh, Big Idol, Dr. Seuss, uh, Keith Haring, Roger Hargraves and Big Daddy Roth. If you guys don't know who Big Daddy Roth is, he's a huge inspiration to me. But all these guys had an innate understanding of how their process and craft worked. They knew it so well. They, would, they did all these amazing things. And these guys really inspired me to realize that I should learn how things are built. Later on in life, I learned that not only knowing how things are built is great, but it also makes you recession-proof because you can always build to the next thing. So when I was younger, and that's not too long ago, but when I was younger, I had this thought of being the smartest person you were going to meet today. And that's a pretty lofty thing to say, right? Because there's a lot of smart cats out there, and I'm probably nowhere near smart as half them people. But it was an aspiration of mine to go and do that. And what allowed me to do that was the old legends, the old people in the neighborhood that either did things by hand or understood like the process because it taken them so long, they understood how things would work. And I learned from so many of these older guys. Matter of fact, there was even one guy who was a type designer at one time that was working as a um, in a pastry shop, which absolutely blew my mind because in college, I'm like, what's typography? Like, what is that stuff? And then I met this guy who started breaking down letter forms and stuff in the bakery as he's doing his pastries. It was one of those experiences where I, I'm just so fortunate that I kept asking for help and like learning how people did stuff because it always kept me wondering and realizing there's a lot of overlap between the two. So with all that said, I really just kept meeting as many people as I could and always learn how they built their trade and then they did stuff. Now that takes me to the next thing, which, you know, it's great to be the smartest person, right? It's great to learn from people. But the one thing it also does is that it takes time. You got to give yourself time. When I graduated from college, I didn't feel comfortable calling myself a graphic designer because I felt like I didn't know anything. And I was crazy fortunate to get an apprenticeship with a print shop that started helping me understand what a grid is. And I know I went to college for it and it didn't make sense in college. But when I went to this print shop, all of it made sense. Bleed, gutter, uh, with height, safety, all that stuff. I learned so much from those guys. It was six months of my life. And it's something where it was, it was a pillar. It was a cornerstone of my career. And then as I started getting better and learning more things, it wasn't until maybe four years in 
that I felt comfortable calling myself a graphic designer because I felt like I had some knowledge of how things got done. But the other thing I did too, and this is probably the nuttiest, is that when I moved to New York, my first eight years, I had no TV. I had zero distractions. All I had was my laptop, my paints, and my art books and code books. And that's all I did. And maybe like Saturday night, I may go out to a party, have a good time, whatever. But it was only Saturday night because I wanted to recover on Sunday if I did too much on Saturday. And then I was ready to go on Monday. And I did that for eight years straight. And it made me so disciplined on my stuff that got me to where I'm at. And honestly, I still had a great time, even though I didn't have a TV in the house. So I'm going to pause for a second, take a little sip. Because I did a lot of talking, but what I want to do is dive into my process. I got two things I'm going to share with you guys. The first one I'm going to share is how I am a process of me being a designer. And then I'm going to show you guys how I think my process as a fabricator and how the two are actually one. The only difference between what I do as a visual designer and what I do as a fabricator is control Z. That's it. Because what I think as a designer, once I get it into a format, I can build anything. Same with the fabricating. But if I make a mistake, I can't undo it. Right? If you ratchet something too tight, you broke it, that's it. You start from scratch. Obviously, as a visual designer, it's just controls you to get it done. So let's get into what you see on the screen right now. This is data visualization for a, a uh, plugin that's called Sankey. Or Sankey, sorry, Sankey. And the challenge was, how do you make that legible? And I'm thinking, dude, this is crazy. Like, how, I don't know how you're going to do this. And then add to boot that when you add this, we have this thing that pops up when you hover over the lines to tell people stuff. I thought, yeah, man, dexterity, it's going to be amazing to try to do that with all your hands and all that. But I love a challenge. So my first thing was I went to the site and I did some research. It was one of the uh, D3 uh, plugins for data visualization. And I looked at it, and my first concern was, how do I get the curves to go? How do I do those curves? And I realized that all that curve was was exactly 50% curve here and curve here, the easier curve, which gives it that line. And as the columns get wider, that curve just gets wider too. Once I figured that out, everything else was a snap. And because I put together the design system, I went ahead and got this. And I actually have examples that I can share with you guys to show it to, uh, running. Uh, and if you give me a quick second, I'll show you here. This is the original Sankey. Or Sankey, sorry. Come on, YouTube. Don't embarrass me. Uh, well, hopefully this one will run. Or you know what? Give me a moment. I'll see if I can pull it up here real quick. Awesome. We don't need no YouTube. So if you guys could see my screen, give me a couple thumbs up if you can see it. No thumbs up. Oh, there we go. Cool. We got some claps. Awesome. So you see here, that's how it animated right out the gate. Crazy bananas. How does that work? After I got done with my work in Figma, I was able to give them this. And while this is a work in progress, the screen uh, iteration, it actually shows it like animated through like you saw in the previous one. So like I said, just a little bit of understanding of production of how things are put together will take you miles. So when you actually do your visual layouts, you're not handing a nightmare to the developer because they will balk and they will say they can't do it. But if you come in with a, uh, I would say an intermediate level, of just HTML and CSS, nothing more than that. Just knowing that is more than enough to be able to hand them something and they won't blow back on you saying, we can't build that. <clears throat> but moving forward, there's actually a couple of other things that can be done with this as well. And more importantly, it's the power of eight. And what I love about the power of eight is that it's one of the many things that I do in order to align my work both vertically uh, and with all the iconography and the text. Now, you can see here, everything is aligned to the grid. It totally sits well. So that means every font size that we set is an increments of eight, 
my base font is always 16. And then I go up 1.5, 1.5, that actually comes out to eight pixels because it's literally half of 16. So therefore my line height will be 24. And that also makes it compliant as well from a usability standpoint. Now moving further, iconography normally is set at 16. That makes life a lot easier. So now I can keep literally everything aligned in my layout and it makes for less uh, hardship for when the developers get it and say, oh, you're gonna have all these problems. Uh, even my corners, I did my corners at four. Cause again, it's, I mean, while four divides into eight, anything uh, with eight is a lot easier to work with because it makes it easier for me to tell other designers, other developers that as long as it's in increments of eight, it should align and we shouldn't have any trouble. And then more importantly, when I put this together, I keep my components simple. So you'll notice that at the top left, I have all my button styles. I have it with the button and without, I'm sorry, with the icons and without the icons. And the icons will turn off which one we want, left or right. Now, technically, you could probably do this with just one button and turn them on and off if you need with icons or without. But the designers on the team and myself thought it'd be easier just to set it up this way and put it together, but it's obviously crazy simple than what I see a lot of these kits where there's like every flavor under the sun. And I wonder how many people really use that. Now, take another drink. And we're gonna break down me as a fabricator. Again, this is totally random. <clears throat> I love working on classic cars. This is my 1964 Impala. I did every inch of this car with my bare hands. It took me about three years to do it. And I had a couple of guys help me. Where they helped me was painting it. And I learned welding. But everything else, once I started doing it by myself, it became amazing how I did it. What I want to share with you is how my designer skills translated to that of me as a fabricator. Right? So again, as a designer, how did I take them skills and bring it to fabrication? I have an air ride suspension on this car. What that means is kind of like a low rider. It goes up and down, does all that stuff. What you see here is a schematic for how I needed my pressure to run inside the car. And I had to do three iterations of it. It took me about maybe 12 attempts to get it to work, but I did. So concept one, concept two, and then inevitably one that worked was concept three. Now, I share these because as a designer, I could see it in my head. So I don't need to make it pretty or any of that kind of stuff. I just got to make it like mechanically work, like literally mechanically work and try to get this thing to go. This next slide shows you the process. Starting in the upper left corner, it's a pencil sketch. It's like whiteboard stuff. The one to the right of that is me aligning things because I'm trying to get it to work like you saw in my diagram. And then the one to the uh, upper right corner that shows the valves with the numbering system and how it's all got to connect. If we go to the bottom left, that's me taking the back seat out of the car, getting all the wiring together. Uh, the one uh, bottom middle shows the plugs actually connected to the wires. And then the last bottom right shows the compressor and everything connected. And it looks a lot like what I did here. Compressor, my valves on both sides and my tank very similar and again as a designer think about that process of you coming up with a concept on paper or even just a verbal idea bring it to paper do some wire framework maybe a couple of flows get into some look and feel same thing except this one required a little bit more hands and the other one you know i got the, the power of control z but the best part of doing all this stuff and it's a shameless plug i get to do it with my kids people in the neighborhood because I know there isn't a lot of guys that have been doing this stuff out in the street. And I absolutely love doing it. And I love being able to share it like I do as a designer. I'm going to wrap it up real quick. I love that quote. Because you're under pressure to learn as much stuff as you can right now. And as fast as possible. And trust me, dude, I know the feeling because I went through that back in Philly when I didn't even know code and I saw the internet. I overwhelmingly got around the pressure because I thought, yo, I'm never going to get a job. But what got me going is I just kept pushing and I also asked for help. I asked people to give me their insight. Like, how do you do this stuff? There's another great quote, and it reminds me of a, a guy, Mike Leopanto, who definitely was a father figure to me. He had said to me, you know how you get wisdom? You get wisdom from experience. 
And you know how you gain experience from your mistakes. And I love that quote. I love that. So you get wisdom from experience and you get experience from mistakes. And that's the thing. Don't be shy to make some mistakes. Do as many as you can because you're only going to learn. All right. As we get to our final parts here, my advice for all of you cats, act like a generalist. You want to learn as many things. You can you can specialize in something, right? Like, you know, I, I enjoy doing visual design work. So, yeah, I focus there. But I understand code. I understand UX. I understand research, input, product managers, and all the stress everybody's going through. I can absolutely sympathize and empathize with my colleagues. And that's because of me being a generalist. Another thing is don't be scared to learn new stuff, especially when it comes to old problems. I Again, building the cars. I do things with building the cars. And realize, oh, my God, that's a way that I can apply to doing it here as a visual designer. And it's all from learning new things. And needless to say, that leads us to always remain creative, always remain curious. Here's how you could do it. Identify uh, your skill gaps, meaning like if you know design but don't know typography, totally learn that stuff. Why is it important how they do these things? Try to do a layout with nothing but black and white and a font and see what you could do. You could self-educate. There's plenty of that stuff out there. YouTube, obviously, ADP list has a lot of great people, including myself, that are out there that would be more than willing to give you advice on how you do stuff. But you could take courses, too. There's a lot of that stuff on LinkedIn. Again, YouTube and the like. Uh, and then when it comes to your portfolio, <coughs> I know a lot of people try to put a lot of stuff in there. But one really well-thought-out portfolio uh, case study. That's all you really need. If you could just show one, at least that's one that you could bring to somebody and say, hey, what do you think? Get their feedback and then maybe go do another one. It always starts with one. And last but not least, interview with as many people as you can. It ain't going to hurt you. You'll make your network like I did when I was younger and then inevitably be able to get up on your feet to go do your thing. And uh, I think, uh, Sandeep, I think I kind of ran through that real quick. I didn't realize I was going to get it done in such a short amount of time. But uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, let you guys know that, again, whatever I can do to help out, uh, anything that's out there, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on ADP list. And yeah, well, uh, I'll see what I can do for you guys. All right. Let me uh, let me look through here. I see a lot of people are, you know, pinging the screen and the like. And I got some questions. Awesome. All right, Rajesh, I used to be a full stack developer and now and i transition into product design how would my technical skills help me in product design awesome dude as a full stack developer no one's going to tell you what you can and can't code what you can and can't build so i would totally without a doubt uh, leverage and you will you're going to leverage that skill as a developer when it comes to talking about product design however what i wouldn't do is i wouldn't let my uh full stack developer side uh put the kibosh or like stomp out someone else's idea from product because they may have something that you didn't think of, but you could totally call baloney if you hear something that doesn't seem right when it comes to doing this stuff. All right, next question. There's a lot of no code dev platforms. I love this already that are trending these days. Would it be valuable in the long run to be depth and learning code? Absolutely. You know, I could give you a brilliant brilliant example and that is a bit of an analogy imagine you're driving down the road you get a flat tire in your car you got to get some service to come help you because you never learned how to change a tire real basic it's the same thing here while no code no code is good because it helps get things off the ground i still think you should learn code absolutely and again you don't have to be like really deep in it like Steve Wozniak or none of that stuff, right? You don't need to get that deep, but you should definitely understand, you know, what is PHP? What's a hook? What's a loop? What's a Boolean, right? How can I set up my uh, my file in Figma to accommodate if I'm doing something in React? You can do all that kind of stuff. So yeah, totally learn some code, but use the no code stuff to help you plow through things very quickly. What an interesting and insightful presentation, Joey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rama. Become a designer nowadays can be much easier compared to several years ago when many tools 
uh, it's hard to see, uh, really new. Yeah, so I I don't think the struggle is any different. When I was younger, I didn't know anybody. I was from South Philly. Like, what comes out of South Philly? They're all boxers and stuff, right? Like, nobody's really, you know, doing design work. And that was back in, like, the like late 80s. But I love this stuff. And what got me there, it was the same challenges that we go through now. There's a ton of code out there, a ton of new software and stuff. How do you get things done? And the struggle is real. But I also think that if, as long as we keep our head on our shoulders and continue just to learn the new software coming out there, you'll be fine. When designers create ideation and wireframes, would you recommend to involve devs in that stage? Great question. I think ideation should be done with the designers first, personally, but I wouldn't let my hopes get up until I bring it over to dev to show them that idea. Now, it's not to say you can't evolve dev during your ideation process, but as designers, I've always found it where I like to be kind of off the wall idea thinking, and I'm not usually around developers that want to be on the off the wall thinking. Again, it's not to say they're not out there, but a lot of the times they want us to come back with some ideas that they can go and build. But by all means, I don't have a, a door to my office so people can walk in whenever they want to, to be a part of it. How to work with devs who want to use REMS versus EMS. Okay, so REM would only be used once. I mean, obviously, no. Actually, I take that back. Take that all the way back. It's late. Um, REMS can obviously be used wherever you want to use them in the code. But I personally set my base font for one M, and then everything else can connect to that, whether it's relative with just M's or going to the root, which would be the REMS part. However, up to the developer, uh, can you fight them? You could. I would probably be curious why they want to do REMS and try to solve that problem than just say, no, you got to go to M's. There might be a technical reason why they want to go with REMS. After taking courses, what would be the best route to take? Working on portfolio and improving more or working as an intern? Dude, as an intern, absolutely positively. I mentioned earlier that what got me through in the beginning was all that hands-on stuff, like being an apprentice. While you could still work on your portfolio, uh, and, you know, slight tangent, when I worked in Philly as a waiter, when I was done at the restaurant, I would take the little bit of money I had and I would go up to a Kinko's, which is where we would print stuff back in the day. And I would sit there with some of the food from the restaurant, working on my portfolio for like another hour until I was able to get an actual internship where they thought I was good enough. And then I would do the same thing. So I would go to my internship, then go to the restaurant, then go back to work on my portfolio. So totally, if you get the chance to be an intern, 100%, but that doesn't mean you stop your portfolio. Never stop building your portfolio. Um, yeah, so Joy, uh, we almost like answered, uh, the questions in the Q and A tab. And I do have a few questions. Like, uh, people always talk about, like, how do you, uh, uh, define the best practices, uh, doing the design handoff between like the designers and the developers has been in a, a never ending topic in, uh, uh, budding startups, uh, especially. Yeah. And funny, cause then they, we were talking before the event and I mentioned how I worked in Kochi for a little bit. I worked in a lot of countries, not just, but Kochi, obviously, because you're in, you're close by in Chennai. But I say that because each group has its own handoff process. So back in the day, there wasn't any storybook. There was no zero height. Like you had to hand them like these Photoshop files that had all the values and heights mixed in there. And it was really crazy. But each shop has their own methodologies and processes. And what I like to do is find out how they're currently getting stuff but also find out, and this is with dev, also asking dev, how do you want it? Because if they're working in React or if they're working, uh, maybe they, they are using the Ant design system to go get their stuff done, there might be a particular way they need things. And then there's that conversation where, okay, if you want it this way, that actually takes me more time than if, if we did it this way. And there might be some wiggle room between the two. Usually there is. If you go in with a dollar branch, usually they'll meet you halfway. Great, great. And um, especially like as the uh, starters were uh, like the, for the starters and the beginners in the design uh, industry. So what are the tools you would suggest like, for them to communicate better with the developers uh, during the time of handoff 
uh, during the time of discussion as well like apart from like the figma inspect tab like the most people like uh, get used to yeah so that like if you've ever seen a developer use figma they get lost they get lost trying to find stuff on the left side and to watch them and i remember i was kind of getting frustrated like dude just click on the page but because figma has the scroll bars hidden it isn't until they hover over the page part that they could scroll down the page and then see the other art boards and when I saw that, I thought, man, I feel like a total clown right now because here I am supposed to be sympathizing and empathizing with people and I'm just getting irritated that you just can't find it. But it's because in their mind, they didn't see a scroll bar. Well, obviously it's not there, it's hidden. And I thought, dude, that's amazing. That's totally amazing. But again, knowing how they want their stuff and talking to them about it, it's all comes down to a conversation. And again, if you can make their lives easier and it doesn't cost you any headache, that's a win-win for everybody. But again, I'm sorry, I, I kind of answered your question. Like, when it comes to the tools and all that, yeah, it really does come down to what the current framework is, right? Because I think sometimes designers that come into a process, they want to change everything. And I'm very cautious about that. So uh, doing some work uh, with that agency I showed you, I didn't change squat. Like I didn't touch anything at first. I just looked at everything. I spent about a week just looking at how all the components were. I did a couple layouts, but I didn't add anything to the design system. And then I came back with recommendations to go and get it done. But I would not touch that. That's like that's like a train flying down the tracks and all of a sudden you want to turn left. You know, like, no, it's going too quick. We're going to have to slow it down in order to make that kind of move. Yeah. And uh, especially in small teams, like when do you suggest to have a uh, design technologist, like basically the person who converts the uh, design system into the basic code uh, snippets for the developers to like uh, use it as a library for them, right? So when do you suggest like that would be a right time to hire someone like specifically, like irrespective of the uh, in-house development, like in-house developers? Yeah, maybe the right time. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so that, that kind of goes back to being a generalist. And I do think that in order to understand how things are done, you, you have to do it. Right. You have to do it. And even if it's writing a little bit of code, that's fine. But when to add that person, I would say when it's taking too much time away from doing what you're really good at. So I've actually launched several small businesses and each one of them, I wore every hat. And, you know, the hat that I got rid of the quickest was doing all the accounting. I hated that stuff. The first the first amount of money that I got that I was like, oh, my God, I can hire someone to do that. Totally go do that. I so don't want to touch that stuff at all. And the last few people that I really stocked up on were developers. Because at the time, a lot of the designers are working with me in the studio. They knew how to do the layout, but we still were having a hard time finding front end developers. And that, that was a lesson where I learned the big difference between a front end developer and a back end developer. So back end developers can do the work, but they may, may not pay attention to the nuances where a front end developer is going to be all over that stuff. And they might actually add the letter spacing a uh, bit of CSS. Why? Because they know, oh, he's got it at 0 0.05 M. So let me do that here because it'll give it a little more breathing room. Most back end developers are like, dude, you can read it. We're good. Keep going. Yeah. And we got a few more questions from the, uh, uh, from the folks. Uh, what dev frameworks do you recommend that designers should be knowledgeable in? Man, that's a lot. But I can tell you this. Again, there's so many different frameworks out there. They all come down to some margin and grid and some column. And usually it's 24 or 16. Now, you can't really gauge the width, right? But what you can gauge is the margin and column or the margin and gutter, which is totally fine. However, the other big thing that I can point out is when I was working with KPMG, they were all Microsoft. So guess what kind of charts we were running? High charts. That was it. And I would go in, I'd look at, the, oh, we're going to use this kind of chart to get our stuff done. I'll go to inspector. I would see how the things were done in inspector and immediately start to copy that and put it into what I got to do. At the time, it was sketch. But bring it over to sketch. The reason being, they were absolutely not going to change that framework. You're not going to tell them to go change that, right? They're not going to listen to you. Just like a developer is not going to come to you and say, hey, use XD. Like, who's going to use that, right? Like, no, I'm not using that. Get out of here. I'm going to Figma. I'm leaving. But, <coughs> excuse me, but knowing what that framework is and aligning with them there, yeah, that's totally a call for Dev, and I, I wouldn't really step on their feet. Right. Um, yeah, and one more question is that, what are your tips for single app developer to create good design if their background is only in programming? 
So a lot of developers usually go to a template. And that's no different than a designer going to a template. I have no shame in my game. I think if you're going to do that and you see something there, you can use it. That's great. But I would also say as a developer, don't be shy to maybe change the font. And then also don't be shy because when people give you feedback, don't take the feedback as negative. A lot of times constructive criticism goes a long way. Now, that's not to say if someone comes to you and says, hey, that sucks, because that's obviously being quite rude. And I'd have to look at them like, yeah, dude, well, guess what? No, thank you. I don't need that. But if someone's going to give me constructive criticism and say, you know, that's not really a, a font that I can read. Cool. I like that. That tells me you can't read it. Maybe other people can't read it. Or uh, those colors, I can't really see the gray because it's too light. Okay, cool. Maybe I make it a little darker. And that's another way that you can get some active feedback and then slowly become that visual designer that's kind of scratching away at your heart. Yeah. And uh, the question from my end is that uh, uh, how frequent you would think like for a company uh, to update their design guidelines uh, to stay up to up to date with the market oh, or the industry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how frequent it should be? Uh, oh, so in the industry, I'm real. Uh, I'm like a hermit. I, I don't I don't jump to that kind of stuff right away because I think a lot of times there's a lot of hype. Uh, and again, Figma, while it's got a lot of great stuff, there's a lot of hiccups with that thing. And if you haven't seen half the stuff that goes down when it comes to like, you know, changing certain properties on that, <clears throat> then finding out like, why is it doing this? Yeah, but it's not the poo-poo on it. But again, it's not the saving grace. However, staying on top of things, I think it's good just to go and read blogs. Obviously, your friends are going to give you stuff, LinkedIn, TikTok, all that good jazz. You can go check it all out. But as far as like making changes go, when you build enterprise design systems, I don't uh, I don't build yachts anymore. I used to build a lot of yachts, like figuratively, uh, where they looked really good, but it was a one and done. Now I build aircraft carriers. I'm building things that are going to go out into the deep end of the world to go take care of business. And those things don't happen overnight. Great. And also like a few more questions. Uh, uh, folks, like you can put your questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, we can have, get it answered. And one question is that... Uh, what do you consider as an ideal design team? Let's say uh, there is a team dedicated for UI, a team dedicated for UX, one team dedicated for design system management. So how do you define an ideal design team? Like uh, when it comes to startups or uh, uh, enterprise level companies? Hmm. Well, I, I would say it, it goes to like what this whole conversation was that I did, right? I think that there's a lot of people that should be a part of like a generalist type team. And what does that make? Now, I think some of us can wear multiple hats for sure, but picking the team comes down to not just the skills they have, but the culture that they bring as well. So you want to bring in a group of guys or girls that are, you know, multi-talented, right? Obviously they got to have good hand. They got to have good verbal skills, good verbal communication. <clears throat> they have to be understanding of what some limitations might be. And then lastly, I would look to get people that uh, enjoy what they're doing while you know, again, everybody needs money and that's all good. But when I was younger, I took less money so that I could work with more important people. Matter of fact, I even had the chance to study with Milton Glaser and I actually turned down the chance to work with him uh, as an intern because it wasn't paying. And I always think now, granted, I still got the chance to do work with him when he was alive. And this is again, going like many, many years ago, but I turned down the opportunity to be his intern because he didn't want to pay me for three months. And I, that's something I won't ever get over. Every time I look, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe I said that, how stupid I was. But again, just to point out that when these opportunities come up, granted, if you're going to learn a lot, it's way worth what you would get in money if you were to go and do, uh, you know, take an internship or just be a part of a team where you get to do multiple stuff. Great, great. Uh, nice to hear uh, all these insights from you. And uh, so happy to host you in this session, especially. And folks, for you, uh, kindly post uh, post your uh, feedback in the feedback link uh, attached there, uh, pinned in the chat section. And thank you so much, uh, Joey, again, for all these wonderful insights for a, uh, a great presentation as well. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, guys, thank you so much. Uh, you can find me on ADP List. You can find me on LinkedIn or wherever, but I'm, uh, anybody that I can help out, just let me know.